Welcome to this short video about trends in the pharmaceutical industry. And what I'll mainly focus about is how we have to adapt both our production processes, but also the downstream and things like such as, for instance, packaging in order to meet those trends. And you will see some of them are more general, such as the focus on sustainability and working towards net zero targets. Other ones are very specific towards the healthcare industry. And you will see particularly that some of the trends have been accelerated because of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, which has caused like a shift in our healthcare system. Let's have a look at some of these trends in the pharmaceutical industry. So first of all, we need to understand that our healthcare system has been rapidly changing over the last couple of years. Part of that has been driven by an aging population. So we have a relatively older population uh, who have multimorbidity, such as chronic diseases that are very complicated to manage. So how do we do that? Because there's already a lot of burden on our healthcare system. So we see some of these trends play into this. So precision medicine, and you might also come across the term personalized medicine, even though people tend to prefer the term precision nowadays, because it doesn't necessarily mean the medication is personalized towards the individual patient. This means that we take more into account and there's no one treatment that just fits all. So think of, for instance, here in terms of cancer treatment, uh, where we know that cancers are very heterogeneous. So look at the example, for instance, in breast cancer, there's a big difference between estrogen positive and estrogen negative breast cancers. So you will have a lot of diagnostic tests done before they come up with the best treatment plan for you. And this is not just in the area of cancer, as many other areas such as infections or where you consider what antibiotics to give, uh, but also things that are lifestyle related. So think as for instance, the medication that people get for Parkinson's. You will consider whether patients are still very active, what kind of diet they have. So there's more a move towards this. And as I mentioned, because of this aging population, this is becoming more and more important to have some flexibility in there. Now, part of why we can facilitate precision medicine is that there is availability of big data. There are simply just many more things that we can monitor nowadays and easily. So in terms of sensors, I have like a whole video on how we're going from like traditional blood tests uh, towards more remote monitoring. So think of, for instance, like your watch and how much data you can extract on that on, for instance, your heart rate, how many steps you walk, etc. So we know that there are many more things that we can measure, which also means that we need to figure out how to interpret this. And this is where artificial intelligence for sure, and I'll come back to this in the later uh, slides, will play a very important role in your healthcare system. So the, the other thing to consider is that the medications that are coming to the market are becoming more and more complex. So rather than having just a focus on small molecules, we're also looking at bigger molecules and there the pharmacokinetics are far more complicated and also the bioreactor production process. So we need to make sure that we adapt our reactors towards these, uh, these medications and coming back to if we are moving towards precision medicine, we're actually having more drugs on the market. Uh, and probably they need to be available in smaller volumes. So this is where this demand for actually smaller and continuous reactor comes into play. So rather than simply scaling up, you might see this principle of scaling out smaller reactors, but you can produce more of it by simply increasing the number of reactions. So traditionally, most medication has been in the form of a tablet. Uh, and a tablet can be problematic because of the bioavailability of the active compound. And think of, for instance, what will happen if this will have to pass through your stomach. Now, this is why there are other types of products on the market nowadays. So in this, uh, what it actually means by this is that it can be a drug for injection, uh, a drug injectable emulsion, a drug injectable uh, suspension, and a drug as a suspension. So these are the different types of products that are very different than tablets. But think of, for instance, the prospect that we can also have like drug delivery systems. So you can have, for instance, patches that release these drugs over time, which will have very different requirements just for the production itself or implantation of drugs. Now, the final point is around democratizing healthcare. And what we mean by that is that there is, because of this aging population, more and more of a population of want to stay at home longer and remain their independence. And we can only enable this by having remote monitoring approaches in place. So this actually would reduce some of the stress on uh, the NHS, for instance, here in the UK or on the healthcare system. It would have healthcare options at home. 
And I think some people have even pitched that people would have their own 3D printer so they can produce their own drugs at home. Uh, but what it also means is that you go from a big centralized system where you have very specialist people working with you towards decentralizing this. So is there a way of, particularly for older people, is making things more accessible so rather than having to go to a very specialized center, what can we do at home? What can we do at GPs? And that might also mean is that we have to have different products into place that actually enable this for people. However, in order to achieve this, as I mentioned, the skill set will be quite different. So big data analytics and AI will become more and more important because we need to have more data available of these people staying at home for longer. And we will need to adapt our reactors towards facilitating these precision medicine approaches, but also for the production of these more complex medications. So what does it mean in terms of the requirements for your production process? Well, a big thing, and as I mentioned, some things are not just specifically towards the pharmaceutical industry, but in general, there is a pressure for industry because of legislation and guidelines to meet net zero guidelines in order, obviously, to combat climate change. So that means that more and more of a focus comes into play into sustainability. So here, rather than focusing on an individual unit, it's very important to look at a blockchain process and consider the process as a whole. So that goes towards from like your raw products all the way end towards the packaging and the distribution. So we'll need to take energy requirements into consideration. Can we use things such as, for instance, renewable energy on plants? What is the amount of water that we used? What waste are we generating and how are we disposing of this waste? So can we take a circular economy approach rather than, for instance, having to incinerate or use landfill for certain waste? And what do we do about the packaging? I think we all know that the pharmaceuticals are often plastic packaging. So what can we do in terms about recycling there? So point two and three are really linked. So first of all, because the processes are becoming more complicated, the control systems that we have into play are becoming more complicated. And actually, if you look at smaller reactors, they're often more difficult to control uh, than the bigger ones. And particularly if we work with these continuous processes and we don't understand the process that well. So I have a video on introduction to quality by design, which has been stipulated by the FDA. And what it means is that you have an inbuilt quality control system. So the consequences, if you have a chemical product, which is simply of spec, just means a loss of productivity and extra costs that come with it. However, you can imagine that if you are going to use this on people, this has far more reaching consequences. So this quality by design means that we have to understand the process a lot better. So it means that we need to control it a lot better and that modeling becomes more and more important. And this is where it's actually helpful that you have these smaller reactors because you can test them on a smaller scale and then you can use your models in order to scale it up. And the scale up is quite complicated uh, because as I mentioned before, like the physiochemical parameters, no matter what you do, will always change. Now, the final point comes back to the fact that we need to start automating systems. And uh, this, for instance, think of, for instance, automated robots that you can use, packaging that we can automate. And if this automating works really well, that also means that it will enhance the quality control because you start to take away some of the things that might actually give variation in your products. And linked to this quality by design is that we need to trace the whole production process. So we need to understand what happens at every single step. And actually having automation is not just for the production, but also for instance, for the sampling and the screening, it would give a better understanding. But what's really crucial here is that because all of this is rapidly changing and we need to train the next generation of engineers in order to keep up with these changes. Now, finally, I'm going to end off with this uh, table, which I think is quite nice in terms of showing the trends, but also the implications of what's happening, which is prepared by McKinsey and company in 2022. Now, the first thing to consider here is that there are rapidly a new number of treatments coming onto the market. So we're looking at, for instance, cell and gene therapy, but also different vaccination technologies after the COVID pandemic. And what has happened is that normally this is kind of a slow process, but here, even these two, they've risen from 11 to 21% of the drug development pipeline. And this is really an exponential growth and it's far faster than the sector has ever seen. So you will see there are a lot more things that we suddenly need to implement, which obviously means that the skill set is rapidly changing. 
So some things are more generic across industries, but you have to imagine because of the pharmaceutical industry, because of the extreme costs that come with simply development of one drug, this means that this industry is very susceptible and it's a very high impact of uh, challenges in the labor market. So finding people with the right skills, but also because of rising inflation, that you have the cost set for trained people is becoming rapidly more expensive, but also your raw products and simply the use of energy because you use quite energy intensive processes. Now, supply chain disruptions are another thing to consider, and particularly during COVID, it was a big risk that people weren't able to get the normal products from normal sources. And this is why the sustainability impact is so important to consider and to check that you have everything available relatively close to where you produce it. So you need to carefully think about where you source everything from and where it's being processed. But the key thing to see from this graph, and that's why I've highlighted digital technologies before, there are also massive savings opportunities. So the advances in digital technology and uh, AI but also the willingness for us and for trained personnel to accept this are becoming rapidly more and more important in order to reduce the costs. And this way we can perhaps combat some of the challenges associated with inflation and labor market challenges. Another thing to consider is the pressure to innovate. Um, so some of the drugs have been on the markets for decades and work really well. But patents are also really important in the pharmaceutical industry. So there we need to know that when a patent runs out for a company, it's become suddenly less and less profitable. So that means there's some pressure to innovate. And sometimes you look at these, what we call me too drugs, where only minimal changes are made to the drugs, but you can patent it. But with the development of these new drugs, such as for instance, cell and gene therapy, and there certainly have been issues around the implementation of vaccination technologies, we also need to make sure that people are still willing to accept it and to use it. So there is certainly a pressure in terms of an economic perspective of bringing new drugs to the market, but we should always kind of carefully balance that with uh, the efficacy of the drugs and also the price of the drugs that's available. Because one thing that's really important to consider are healthcare inequalities. Because a lot of treatments, think of for instance very complicated cancer treatments, are simply not available in each country. Or if we look at certain medical diagnostic tests, some uh, places simply don't have the resources to conduct them. So here I've highlighted some of these pharmaceutical trends and I think some of the key uh, challenges that lie ahead. So what kind of as engineers we need to keep on challenging ourselves and upskilling our uh, skills really. And finally, also if you think of the production process, particularly the sustainability element is becoming more and more important. So for instance, I would like to learn more about life cycle analysis so I can actually put this into practice. Thanks very much for watching and if you want to know more about the sustainability impact or about bioreactors in general, then have a look at this playlist, Introduction to Bioreactors, or have a look at this video on net zero in the pharmaceutical industry. Thanks for watching.